If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and turn to James chapter 1. As you're turning there, I want to invite you this Wednesday night uh, to be back right here in the worship center at 645 for a night of prayer and worship. Uh, we do this on the Wednesday following Labor Day. Every single year, we invite our Spanish congregation in, and it's just uh, our church coming together. We do it at each of our locations, and it's just a night of prayer and worship, and that's what we do. For an hour, we're going to pray, we're going to worship, and this Wednesday night is very special because we're ordaining three new ministers as well as a number of new deacons, and so I really want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday night at 645. Uh, it's going to be a great night, and I want you to put it in your calendar. As I was preparing to preach this week, studying James chapter 1, I was reminded of a note card that I've had since I was probably 10 or 11 years old. I'm sitting here with it in my hand. Um, I probably, I, I couldn't have been, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I don't know exactly the date, but I do remember listening to the preacher preach. And when he made this statement, this was my home church growing up, I don't know why it marked me, I don't know why it grabbed a hold of my heart like it did, but I remember taking uh, one of those uh, envelopes from the pew racks. Do you remember those? Anybody grow up in old school church, all right? We've got some here even. Uh, you've got these envelopes, and they were great places to hide your gum when you wanted to spit it out. Uh, great places as a child, you know, when you were bored uh, to, to just draw and fill in all the little blanks. These things, I miss these things, man. You could put your name on there, your, uh, the amount of money that you were given, and then you got to check. Were you here? Did you bring your Bible? Did you read your Bible daily? Uh, did you study your lesson? Did you give? Did you attend worship? I mean, who's going to lie on this, right? You can't do that. Uh, and then it had contacts up here, how many visits that you made to visitors and to members of the church, how many phone calls did you make to visitors and members. Uh, the Baptist church was serious back in the day, all right? Uh, how many letters and cards, I mean, it, this is awesome. But the pastor made this statement, and I remember writing it down, and this card has stayed with me all of these years. As a, as a I remember it was, uh, it, it was thumbtacked. I've got the, the indention right here, uh, right above my desk at home when I was in junior high and high school so I could read it every single day, and I've just carried it with me through the years. Here's the statement. It's in the form of a question. It simply says this, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Pretty good question to ponder. Something to think about. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If they looked at your daily calendar, saw how you spent your time, would they see that God is a priority in your life? If the authorities arrested you for being a Christian and they interviewed your friends and your employers and members of your family, would their eyewitness testimony help build a case for you being a believer or take away from it? They were to look at your bank account. See how you invest your resources. Would they see that the kingdom of God is of value to you? If they were to put you under surveillance and watch you when you didn't know you were being watched, if they were to subpoena your phone, read your text messages, read your emails, do a deep dive into your social media accounts. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you. Evidence is what we're looking for. Not what we say, but what we do. This is exactly what James is after in this letter that he's writing to his congregation. They've been forced from their homes. They've been dispersed. They're living scattered all throughout the Roman world. And they received this letter from their pastor and he's encouraging them to stay faithful, to keep living out their faith. We mentioned in this introductory message of James a few weeks ago that James was a show me what you believe kind of guy. He's pushing his congregation to accept what is going on in their life because God is building their faith. He is pushing them towards spiritual maturity. And what we said is that you can measure spiritual maturity 
One, by whether or not you're enduring trials joyfully. That's verses 2 through 12. Two, whether or not you are defeating temptation consistently. We talked about that last week. That's verses 13 through 18. And this week, James is just going to continue. You can measure spiritual maturity by whether or not you are obeying God's word diligently. This is verses 19 through 27. I'm calling the message today. If you're taking notes, write it down. Living the word. The Bible, God's word, is the theme of this series of verses that we're looking at today. You're gonna see the word mentioned in verse 21, verse 22, verse 23, verse 25. And as I begin reading, I'm actually gonna start in verse 18. We looked at it a little bit last week because it includes the word there as well. Starting in verse 18, James chapter one, the Bible says this, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he was like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The only way there will ever be enough evidence to convict you for being a Christian is if you listen to God's word so that you know what it says, and more importantly than that, that you live God's word out. As James writes here, we are not to be hearers only, but we are to be doers of the word. We are to obey God's word diligently. Now, as we get going, there are two truths that James mentions here concerning the word of God that we need to write down and understand. The first is this, that the word saves. That's verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We are brought forth by. James is using the terminology and language here to describe a pregnancy. We are brought forth. We are born again. We are delivered into this world spiritually. We call that being reborn. How? By the word of truth. We hear the word. We respond to the word and we are saved. Thus, we are brought forth by the word of truth. And James, for his congregations, those who have heard the word and responded to the word, he calls them a a, a first fruits. They were the first conversions, if you will, because they were the very first Christians. All of us followed, but they were the first. Now, here's what's important. Whether... It was the congregation that James had, or whether it's me and you, we were all saved the very same way. We were brought forth by the word of truth. It is the word, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that God uses to save us. This is why when you come to Champion for us, we put a premium on the teaching and preaching of the word of God. Salvation takes place. It can be activated uh, when someone hears the word of God and responds to that word by faith. Paul put it like this in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Earlier in that same chapter, Paul would talk about 
how someone hears the good news and he makes an argument for sharing and preaching Jesus and making sure that the word is communicated. Listen to what he says. Salvation doesn't happen apart from hearing the word. The word saves. Romans 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. People are only brought forth, they are only born again by the word of truth if they hear the word of truth. And this is why it's so important that we share our testimony and that we share the good news of the gospel, that we live on mission, that we make sure that we are evangelists, telling people about our faith. The word saves. Secondly, the word sanctifies. If you're taking notes, write it down. The word sanctify means to be separated. It means to be made holy, to be set apart. So get this, this is what James is writing here. We are saved by the word of truth. And we are also set apart, sanctified by the same word that saves us. Let me show it to you uh, in the image on uh, uh, this screen. Uh, this is fresh on my mind this past week. I was meeting with a group of our seniors. God's always been so faithful uh, through the years to give me a group of senior high guys that I can walk with in a discipleship relationship. And one of the first sessions that I always have with the groups that I meet with or people that I'm discipling is I draw out for them and talk to them about their salvation. And what we're saying here and what James is saying is this. When we are saved by the word of truth, and it doesn't matter when that was for you. For me, August the 3rd, 1989, as an 11-year-old boy, I called on the name of the Lord. I gave my life to Jesus, confessed my sins, said, Jesus, in the best way that I know how, I want to follow you. At that moment, God saved me. I was brought forth. Now, from a theological standpoint, we call this justification. Now, justification is the past tense of salvation. Um, I was saved August the 3rd, 1989. Now we're gonna work out this word justification here in a few weeks because Paul and James seem to be uh, differing a little bit on uh, what they mean when they use the word justification. And we're gonna work what that means out uh, in a few weeks. But just so we know here, we are justified. That is a legal term, meaning when we place our faith and trust in Christ, we're delivered by the word of truth. God saves us instantaneously. Uh, he removes our sin, makes us right with him. He legally declares us righteous. A picture of a judge banging the gavel. Their, their sins are not counted against them. They are saved. Now, if you read Romans chapter 8, verse 30, it won't be on the screen. This is all for free right here, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 30, the Bible promises that if you have been justified, read it for yourself, it says you will be glorified. Glorification is the future tense of salvation. So what Paul teaches in Romans is that if you have been saved, you will be saved. We've heard that doctrine, right? Once saved, always saved. I like to say, if saved, always saved. So we have the past tense, we've been justified, and if we've been justified, Romans 8, 30, we will be glorified, future tense. But there's this present tense right here. From the moment that we trust Christ to the moment that we die, this word right here is called sanctification. It means to be set apart, made holy, what we're talking about. And what James is writing here is that the same word that saves you is the same word that sanctifies you. 
So from the time that you're saved to the time that you will be saved, you ought to be progressively growing to become more and more like Jesus. This is why he sends trials. Chapter 1, we've been looking at verses uh, 2 through 12. This is why he allows trials. Why? Because he is conforming us to the image of his son. He wants to make us more like Jesus. It ought to be our goal that by the time we close our eyes in death, that when we see Jesus face to face, it shouldn't be that much of a transition. Because we've been walking with God. We've been growing with God. We call this progressive sanctification. And the point that we're underscoring this morning is the same word that saved you is the same word that sanctifies you. Same word that makes you more and more like Jesus. John chapter 17, Jesus would say these words. He's praying for his disciples and he's praying for all of us who would one day follow him. Sanctify them, John 17, 17. In your truth, your word is truth. So I want you to consider this morning the importance of the word of God in your life. It's what saves you. It's what grows you up. It's what sanctifies you. It's what strengthens your walk with the Lord. And because of this, there are three actions that are lifted right out of the scripture that James is going to say, because the word saves and because the word sanctifies, there are three actions on our part that we have to make concerning the word of God. The first action is this, we must receive the word. If it saves us and it sanctifies us, we have to receive it. This has everything to do with the posture of your heart. You're going to have a posture of humility toward God's word. And your heart's going to take what God has to say in. Or you will have a posture of pride toward God's word. I know better than God. I can live life on my own terms. I can do my own thing. Jesus, he was uh, giving a a parable uh, one time in his ministry. And he, he parallels Uh, the human heart to fertile soil. Do you remember this parable? If you don't, I'm gonna read it to you. Matthew chapter 13, verse three. He told them many things in parables, saying a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's just, he's underscoring. This is important. Now, what's interesting about this parable is it's one of the only parables in Scripture that Jesus ever interpreted. Usually he would teach in a parable, and he would just let it sit. And people who wanted to understand it had to go do the work. They had to go try to wrap their mind around it. But here the disciples go, will you please explain this to us? And so Jesus does that, starting in verse 18. Here are then the parable of the sower. Now listen to this, We're talking about the heart being like fertile soil. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, fertile soil. What was sown in a soft heart. This is the one who hears the word and understands it. And he indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and another 30. And so if we want the word of God, the seed, to take root in our hearts, we have to ensure that our hearts are soft. That it's receptive to the word of God, that we take a posture of humility. And this is what James gets to in verses 19 through 21. Look back at your text. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, 
For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. A soft, receptive heart begins by having a quiet, humble spirit. It's humble people who are willing to listen more than they talk. It's humble people who aren't quick fused and angry and full of angst so that you can't get through to them. There's an old adage here. Uh, What is it? God gave you two ears and one mouth so that you could listen twice as much as you talk. We're gonna talk about the tongue and our communication. James spends an entire chapter, chapter three, on the power of the tongue. Verse 26 says, if you can't bridle your tongue, 26, chapter one, 26, uh, that you're deceived, your religion's worthless. We'll spend a whole week on talking about language. But what does it mean to be quick to hear? Let's talk listening skills as it relates to the word of God. If we want to hear the word, receive it into our life, we've gotta really listen to it, and let's be honest, we can't listen to it if we're never spending time alone with God in his word. We can't hear God, listen to him, if when we pick up the Bible, there's always the radio on in the background or the cell phone next to us with all the notifications going off. We can't really hear God when we're consumed with busyness, running from one point to the next and there's noise in and everywhere around us. We can't really hear God and what he wants to say to us if we're the ones in our prayer time that's always talking never just quietening ourselves before the Lord when we're in his word so that he can speak to us by his spirit. When we receive the word into our lives, it involves us being slow to speak, quick to listen. We wanna hear what God has to say to us. It involves being humble, having a receptive heart. This is... James, don't be angry. Anger hardens our heart. Not all anger's bad. We know that. Ephesians 4, 26 says, in your anger, don't sin. We see Jesus getting angry. Oftentimes, that's why he was overturning the tables in the temple. People were being taken advantage of, and he had a righteous anger. This is not what James is talking about here. The, the, the word James is talking about here as it relates to anger is like this seething, this seething anger that's underneath the surface. It's almost like bitterness or resentment. Maybe a better word is a grudge. This is the kind of anger that James is talking about here. And it's interesting that he talks about this grudge, this bitterness, this this under the surface anger sandwiched in between these verses on the word of God. Why is that? What is this all about? We talked last week about our sin nature, uh, our flesh. Paul said, there is nothing good in me that is in my flesh. The sin nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. It's repulsed by it. You know what I mean when I say repulsed by it? I mean, anything that the spirit wants, uh, the flesh is repulsed by. Well, it goes like that for the word of truth. Anything that the word of truth wants and longs for our lives Our flesh, our sin nature is so distorted, so corrupt, so perverted that it is repulsed. Gag reflex, okay? Um, I've told people my eating habits are, are, I have the palate of a 12-year-old, okay? Um, Chicken fingers, mac and cheese, Coke Zero, cheese pizza. I'll do a cheeseburger, just don't put tomatoes and lettuce and onions on it, I can't do it, okay? Palate of a 12 year old, I, 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 uh, I love salsa, I love ketchup. But if that salsa's chunky salsa, it repulses me, 
Uh, it makes me, I, I was talking to Debbie about this yesterday, and I said, Debbie, are there any other foods that I'm repulsed by? And she said, well, basically anything that an adult eats, you're repulsed by. <laughs> um, mushrooms, the texture, ugh, it makes me gag thinking about it, repulsed by it. Well, this is, this is our sin nature as it relates to the word of truth. And so watch what James is talking about as it relates to this anger, this resentment, because this anger, again, this is not, this is not something uh, that is a righteous anger. This is not an anger that is an explosive anger at someone. This is just the seething resentment. And in this context, I believe James is talking about an anger toward God. Because what, what does the word of truth do? The Bible says of itself, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And isn't it true, sometimes you come to church or you're sitting in a Bible study or maybe you're having your own time alone with the Lord and sometimes God's word, just because of its very nature, it is a double-edged sword. It is a spiritual scalpel. And sometimes we read the word and it cuts us, does soul surgery on us without anesthesia. And it hurts. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get offended by what God is calling us to do or what he is calling out in us. And if we don't deal with it in an honest and humble way, what happens is we start to get angry at God. I've seen this through the years. God uses his word to address something going on in your life. I could be preaching, and let's say it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where God says, uh, don't be unequally yoked. And there's this business partner that you want to go in business with because you know the ROI would be so good for you. But, but that person is not a believer. They don't share the same convictions and principles you do. And the Spirit of God says, don't do it. And you get mad at God because it's something that you really want to do. Or it's a dating relationship. This person's not a believer, but you're just convinced, just let them be with me. I'll win them to Jesus. And you missionary date, and you're unequally yoked, and you get mad because God's telling you to cut it out of your life. Or maybe it's a Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 passage where the Bible commands us to, that the marriage bed should be undefiled. And yet you're sleeping around before marriage or sleeping around with someone who isn't your spouse, and God the Holy Spirit speaks to you about it, and you get angry on the inside because God's in your grill, in your business. Or maybe it's what we talked about here. James is writing about trials. Maybe God has allowed a trial in your life or maybe he sent a trial into your life and you're mad at God about it because of what you're having to go through, what you're having to experience, the hurt that it's caused you. And you're mad, or maybe like last week, there's a temptation that came by, and you didn't look for the hook, and you were deceived, and you took that hook. And now there's consequences that come with it. And instead of being mad at your flesh and sin nature, instead of being mad at the enemy who tempted you, you're mad at God for the consequences. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. And what James is saying here is don't you be prone to anger and resentment when it comes to your relationship with the Lord. And if you're not humbly receiving the word into your life, there are situations and circumstances that will harden you toward the Lord. And so will you humbly receive his word or in pride reject his word and his voice in your life? He goes on to say, verse 21, put away all filthiness. Rampant wickedness. It's interesting. This, this whole segment on hearing and doing the word of God, that, that, that word there, filthiness, you know what it is? In the original language, it's a biblical term used to describe earwax. James uses it strategically. He says you've got to remove the earwax if you want to hear from God. The filth, moral filth. Like, don't think, listen to me, do not think that you can live how you want to Monday through Saturday and then come on Sunday and hear clearly from God. 
Not gonna happen. Why? Because there is moral filth in your life and it clogs you from hearing the word of God. That's why you can leave sometimes and go, ah, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that, that was all right. I, I didn't really get anything of it. Well, it's not because God didn't speak. His word's going forth. His spirit's moving in his word. Why is it you couldn't hear? It's because there's moral filth in your life. And it has a deafening effect on us as it relates to hearing the word of God. This is why we don't coddle sin. This is why we don't let impurities creep into our life. It's why we don't make small compromises. Some of us would do well to have a spiritual Q-tip in our soul this morning. And say, through confession of sin, God, forgive me for this. Forgive me for this wickedness that I've allowed in my life. Forgive me for this this filthiness that I just wrote off is not a big deal, but it's preventing me from hearing your voice, God. The word saves and the word sanctifies, but it can't do its work if we don't receive it into our lives. Life In the new covenant, Jesus said he would write his law on our hearts. God has planted his word in our hearts. And when we receive it into our lives, it brings life and joy and blessing with it. And this is why we don't just receive the word. But secondly, look at this. We're to reflect on the word. This is verse 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James is just being a preacher here. and He's he's given a commercial. He's given an illustration. And he's saying, don't be like that man who looks intently in a mirror and then just goes away and forgets What he sees, that's someone who hears the word, but it's not doing it. Instead, he calls for reflection. That word there in verse 23, look at it. He looks intently. It's actually a word picture of someone stooping over. Had a buddy of mine with me this week from out of town. I took him by the Lanier Library. I wanted to show him some of the things there. And the Lanier Library, they have a fragment of a Dead Sea Scroll there. And it's in case. And if you want to look at it, you've got to stoop over. It's got a a magnifying glass that you have to look at it through. This is the picture that James is saying here. He's saying, as it relates to the word of God, you've got to look intently at it. Don't look intently at it and then walk away and not do anything about it. No, you look intently at it and let it change the very way that you live. I'm calling on us today, along with Pastor James, to look intently at the word of God, reflect on it, absorb it, saturate yourself in it, memorize it. Remember what the goal of James' book is? He says, I want you to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. He wants spiritual maturity and we will never be spiritually mature if we don't know God's word. If we don't hide it in our heart. This takes time, it takes work. You can't put the Bible under your pillow and think osmosis is gonna happen and wake up in the morning and be godly. Doesn't work that way. You get a reading plan, you get in a life group, you get in a Bible study, you open up to people, you let them speak the word of God into your life. I cannot tell you, on a personal level, there has been nothing that has been more valuable to my sanctification, making me more like Jesus than memorizing God's word. I told the eight o'clock service this morning, I can remember early on in Dallas, I was driving down the tollway, I'm minding my own business, going to a meeting, and I remember looking off to the side and there was this billboard of this adult club. And for some reason, I mean, I'm just driving down the road minding my own business, but what happens? Satan throws that little temptation out there. And I can remember deep within that sin nature, that flesh, just kind of reaching out for that. Look at that a little bit longer. And I thought, dear God, I don't want that. And so he led me to memorize Galatians chapter six, verse seven through nine. And I'm telling you, anytime the flesh starts to wonder, I, I recall this passage of scripture over and over and over. Don't be deceived, Jarrett. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption and death. But if you sow to the spirit, you'll reap life and peace. Therefore, do not grow weary in doing good. At the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. I remember I was studying, uh, I was in a prayer seminar down in West Palm Beach, Florida on Flagler Avenue. They, They give us the afternoon off. We're studying prayer all week. Give us the afternoon off. I go down Flagler Avenue, all of those homes down there, right there on the beachfront, money like crazy. And I can remember my sin nature, my flesh going, woo. Man, you could do this. And I remember pulling off to the side of the road and praying. 
And God gave me 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything that's in the world. For anything that is in the world is not of the Father. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And it was the word of God memorized on, reflected on, that sanctifies my soul, makes me more like Jesus. You get in God's word, you receive it. You reflect on it. And then third and finally, you respond to it. Be a doer of the word. This is the whole thrust of this passage. Don't just say you believe it. Live like it. Live the word. When you read the word, respond to it in a proactive way. If there's a promise to claim, make it your own. If there's a command to obey, obey it. If there's a sin to forsake, avoid it. If there's a lesson to learn, learn it. If there's an example to follow, follow that example. Look at the word and take it in, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. What James is saying is don't deceive yourself, all right? Don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. Yesterday, Coach Prime, Colorado, all right? He's been talking the talk for months. Everybody wanted to know what he walked the walk. And yesterday, he walked the walk. At the end of the day, It's not how much you know the word, it's how much you live the word. We'll spend a whole week in the coming sessions of this chapter on obedience, being the litmus test for true belief in Christ. Rick Warren was once asked, what's the best translation of the Bible? And I closed with his response. He said, my answer, best translation's when you translate it into your life. That's what the Bible study is all about. If you're not translating God's word into your life, you're not studying the Bible the way God intended. God gave us the Bible to transform us, not to simply inform us. It should give us a bigger heart, not a bigger head. In the book of James, we're told, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. In other words, God wants our beliefs turned into behavior. When we respond to God's word by receiving it and reflecting on it and responding to it in a positive way, notice the last part of verse 25, it promises that we will be blessed in our doing. You want a blessed life? Then receive, reflect, and respond to this word that saves you and sanctifies you. You do this, and if you're ever arrested for being a Christian, there'll be more than enough evidence to convict you. Amen? Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus, in person, on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.